welcome to the Marfa Museum, David. We are very excited to listen to your talk. Thank you. Finding the human factor. So the floor is yours. Okay, thanks, Augusta. So, um, <laughs> thank you. Good morning. Um, so, um, my talk is called The Phoenix Factor. Um, excuse the Lady Gaga look. I, I think this is meant to be for the live stream, but um, I will uh, introduce myself in a second. I just wanted to explain a little bit about uh, why I'm here. Um, I uh, am essentially a little bit, come in, come and grab a seat, a little bit obsessed with industrial heritage. And I put up here, because I think this is what we have to do, my background. And I thought that I was in industrial heritage conservation, but in truth, I don't think I am. I think I'm more in uh, community conservation to some extent, and I'll try and explain why. This is some of the projects that I've been involved in in the last 20 years. One was uh, a, uh, a historic steamship, which was actually probably involved in the herring trade, probably came to Iceland. Uh, we acquired it for a pound and raised about four and a half million. And I, I bring this up partly to give you a bit about my background, but partly because this seems to be, for me, uh, the most important part of it all. And, and that's really what I want to talk about. What we thought we were doing was restoring a ship. And what we ended up doing was pr uh, producing um, a, a community cohesion project, um, which became something more interesting. Um, we got quite a bit of funding. We got quite a lot of support. Uh, we built a pontoon in Poland, and we uh, lifted the ship onto the pontoon. And we thought that was the project, but in fact, the project was this. It was much more about the people that we were working with. Um, we worked with uh, two communities. If you're familiar with London, the ship happened to be based in uh, Canary Wharf, <coughs> for historic reasons, uh, in a time when it was... Uh, uh, a part of London that was abandoned. Um, Margaret Thatcher, in her wisdom, decided to build the financial centre of Canary Wharf uh, on the old docks, and it then became a confusion or a conflation of two communities, uh, one of the most disadvantaged communities in London, Newham, and then what became the haves, if you like, the, uh, the, the have-a-lots, the financial world of uh, the investment banks. And we built something that basically brought them together, and that became much bigger than the project we thought we were doing. And this is just another of the projects. Again, we thought we were involved in bricks and mortar, if you like, or nuts and bolts, uh, restoring a historic railway station. And what we ended up doing was producing a design and feasibility study for a migration museum, again, in a uh, disadvantaged part of the country. But not all buildings of uh, historic uh, restoration need to be grand. Uh, this is a small... Victorian brick pump house that we got involved in. Uh, this is something called the Arctic Corsair, which was the last signed winder trawler for Hull City Council, probably involved in the Cod Wars. We're not sure. OK, thank you. We have a feeling that it probably has some historic significance for Iceland as well. Um, this is a building that has historic significance for, Lo for Londoners. Uh, again, if you, if you know London, you may not recognize it. I'll throw it out there. I don't know if anybody does. No? No, it's a good guess. It is a power station. It's Bankside Power Station. Um, most Londoners don't get this. Uh, and it's now Tate Modern. So again, a, a very grand project, obviously, uh, but very much along the lines of what I want to talk about, which is the vision of one or two people who were at Tate Britain at the time um, who saw the possibility of this building. And I can remember cycling around this in, the tw in my 20s. I'm old enough to remember when it was an abandoned power station um, and thinking that'll be bulldozed pretty soon. That'll never work. And then eventually it's now uh, Europe's most successful modern art gallery. I think the numbers are in the region of about uh, 6 million a year. So uh, it just gives you a little bit about my background. <coughs> Excuse me, as I said, I'm not really about the bricks and mortar, and more about how the purpose of restoration works with communities. Uh, and that's part of the reason why I jumped at the chance to come to uh, ESA Fjorda, to the University Center of the West Fjords, when they launched a course called Regional Development and Coastal Communities. Um, and I 
wanted to find out whether some of the work that we'd done in the UK could be replicated uh, in a study. So I decided to try and research this, which is a little bit convoluted, but basically, can the creative adaptation of disused industrial heritage be used for economic and social regeneration? Uh, for non-Icelanders, um, I'll just run through the economic background. Those of you from this part of the world will be familiar with the issue of declining fishing industry, uh, economic st instability, depopulation, and a need to build resilience. And none of that is specific to Iceland in particular, apart from maybe the fishing decline, because most coastal communities are suffering something similar. So uh, this is uh, to introduce you a little bit to the research. I was based up in Isafjorda. I wanted to look at sites around the country. Obviously, I had access to the south and the west and the north, but I didn't get to the east or the southeast. Uh, and the site selection is probably a little bit um, random in the sense that it was based on access, but also um, availability of my interviewees, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, I'll bring up the list of the sites. Uh, and again, they are um, incredibly varied. And one of the reasons why I love this um, subject is because of the variation in the different sites and also the variation in the interpretation methods used to restore them. And in some cases, not to restore them. They're not all restored. I've used the original functions just for the list here, just to slightly be provocative. I'm sure you can probably guess what they are, but I'll go through them in a moment. Um, what I did just at the beginning of the research was to try and understand the uh, types of use or the types of interpretation um, and I'll explain those as I go along. The first of the types uh, I've called educational interpretation. So this is uh, a classic reuse of a building, if you like. Classic is not meant to be pejorative in any sense. Uh, this is just what I've decided for my own research makes it easier to understand. So of these, I've used uh, the Herring Era Museum and the uh, West Fjords Heritage Museum. It, classic interpretations, if you like. They are very closely linked to their original functions. Um, the other type that I've chosen was buildings that have used uh, a different interpretation to their original function. And within that, we can talk about the Art Museum in Akureyri, uh, the Kopelstadia Art Gallery, and the Slaughterhouse, which became the Whale Museum. Now, you might argue there is a link. <laughs> there is a small whaling uh, exhibit within the Whale Museum, but clearly the Whale Museum and the Slaughterhouse are not related. Uh, and this is one of my personal favorites, uh, the fish freezer in the reef um, and uh, the work of Kauri, who's uh, a visionary who has managed to produce something that has made his peers want to stay behind and stay in his community. And that really is the kind of crux of my talk, if you like. It's how do we maintain uh, a critical mass of activity within communities that makes people want to stay and engage and participate in their hometowns. So the third of the uh, typologies uh, I've called commercial spaces. You'll recognize this maybe as the restaurant down the road in the Marshall House, uh, which again is the work of, I would call, two visionaries, uh, Aussie and Steinthor at Kurtogby, architects who saw the potential of this building, but also the owners of the building who saw the potential and made it happen. And it's now obviously a successful uh, art galleries and restaurant. Um, and this is the type of uh, configuration that I've called hybrids, if you like. They are part commercial, part non-commercial. Um, and of that, I've also included uh, the enormous site that is going to be the Gouverneur's Movie Studios. Um, another enormous and incredible vision. Um, on a different scale, Edinburgh House in Isafjorda. And on a very different scale, the guest house that was the salt house in Skagestrand. So you can see there's so many different interpretations, so many different uses, so many different levels of restoration. And on that subject of levels of restoration, one of my types were the buildings that haven't been restored, uh, but have been conserved. So there's a level of abandonment that is uh, maintained, whether for financial reasons, whether for aesthetic reasons, uh, whether for practical reasons, um, those are the following. Uh, I've used uh, Dupovic as a great example. Again, the work of, uh, again, I would call them visionaries or leaders, uh, Eva, Aussie, uh, 
Gida, Magnus, and Hedin, who have made it into an incredible site in one of the remotest parts of Iceland, uh, and the work of Gustav in Hjaltari, uh, who has managed to transform the former herring factory into a contemporary art center. And finally, uh, the less positive side of things, those buildings at risk of demolition. And again, none of this is certain. Uh, that's the point about demolition. They're not demolished until they've gone. Uh, the tool sheds in Akureyri, the industry museum, now may be uh, facing closure. We don't know. Uh, that's not necessarily demolition, but it may be lost, if you like. Uh, the artist residencies in Skagerstrand, not the building itself, but there are uh, workshops alongside which were slated to be demolished. But I believe, from the information I got yesterday, that they have been reprieved. Uh, Reuberhofen, which um, the future is uncertain, and I'm, again, I'd be interested to know more about that, but from what I've understood from Bignerstofnen uh, and the Fragile Communities Program, the future is not clear. And finally, um, a building that we could talk about maybe for hours um, in Fopnerfjorda, which is due to be demolished this year, um, built in the 60s, not listed. Uh, how important is it? I believe Minja Stofnen's report says it's important, uh, but the municipality has decided to uh, go ahead and get rid of it uh, because for practical reasons, I believe it stands in the way of the fish plant. So those were the sites. Um, but as I said at the beginning, I'm not really that interested in uh, the buildings themselves. I know that it's... Um, it seems like it's an architectural presentation, but it isn't really intended to be. My interest is more about how these buildings relate to their communities, how we can use them to develop uh, social cohesion um, and make them work for their localities. And out of that intention, I drew up these six squ uh, research questions, which uh, will become hopefully clearer in a moment. Um, what I did was I interviewed uh, 50 people over 18 months just before uh, COVID. And then again, when I could get back to Iceland, I interviewed uh, more uh, in two stages. And they were essentially stakeholders involved in those sites that I've identified. Uh, so I didn't choose members of the public that weren't directly linked to the projects uh, for various reasons, but partly because I wanted to try and segment uh, most of the comments into direct usage of those sites. Um, what I did was I coded uh, up to about 3,000 comments into primary and secondary subcodes. I won't bore you too much with the methodology, uh, but uh, it ended up being um, <coughs> some work with an application called MaxQDA, and I managed to use uh, that software to identify the comments into different sections. Um, and the, of those different sections, I basically came up with some conclusions, uh, which I'll come on to. But obviously, out of 42 subtopics in, in a half-hour presentation, I can't possibly go through them. They are all in the report, which I'll be very happy to send you. Um, but I'm just going to pick out the ones that really stood out to me as interesting. Um, and if they sound negative, it's only because I think that they are potential ways to become uh, um, more positive about the way that we approach industrial heritage. Um, so some of the comments really related to what I can only describe as shame and humiliation related to the association of those buildings. Um, a turf house is not Notre Dame. A lot of these were kind of probably obvious to Icelanders. I don't know if they are. They struck me as uh, quite harsh in many ways. Um, humiliation was a theme that came up in many of the conversations. Uh, I don't know where We Are Not Savages comes from, but that was one of the comments. Um, the issue for me seemed to be one of uh, a lack of s a sense of um, uh, pride or respect in the built environment, uh, and especially when it comes to industrial heritage. Um, and out of this question of how heritage and local communities relate, I also picked out uh, one of the themes that really struck me uh, around volunteerism. And again, it seemed to be related to ideas of um, exploitation, perhaps. There was a lot of conflation between 
volunteerism and volunteerism, uh, which sounds like a tiny uh, semantic variation, but it's actually a massive difference. Volunteering has nothing to do with volunteerism. Volunteerism has, I believe, a lousy reputation in Iceland. Um, and across the world, there's a book just come out today about volunteerism, uh, which is pretty critical. Uh, a well-managed volunteer project has nothing to do with that. Uh, neither does it have anything to do with low-paid internships. Uh, but again, it's a subject that we could talk about for hours. Um, so those were the two topics that propped, uh, prompted me to uh, highlight them for the first question. The second of my questions I wanted to look at were how we describe value and success. Um, those I look at uh, regenerative hubs. And that's really that keeps coming back and back to uh, the main topic, which is that the buildings that really manage to uh, engage with their communities are the ones that create magnets. They manage to bring their uh, constituency into them, and they manage to provide learning centers uh, and uh, co-working hubs that generate a reason to stay in the communities. Um, in Siglafjorda, for instance, uh, the Siglo Hotel, I believe that was a quote direct from the, uh, the, the investors. Um, but this one I loved particularly, just the fact that we are a magnet. And I'm sure that if you can think of some of the sites that have been successful, you'll understand what I mean. They attract people and they make people want to stay. Um, so the third of the uh, research questions um, talked of partnerships and trails. And again, not a particular um, uh, surprise to find that most of the sites that were successful were the ones that looked at partnerships. Uh, but what did strike me was that many of the partnerships and trails that exist in Europe are not known in uh, Iceland, one of the ones that really struck me was the European route of industrial heritage, uh, which is only marginally um, known in Iceland and could be a huge marketing tool for most of these industrial sites. Look at uh, support from stakeholders. Um, and again, sorry if it sounds negative, but it is the base from which we can hopefully learn and improve. Uh, incoherent heritage strategies just kept coming up and up. Uh, the fact that there doesn't, there doesn't appear to be much uh, cohesion between uh, much planning policy and industrial heritage. Uh, and uh, on that note, uh, in particular, I wanted to drill down into uh, tourism. And, and I came up with that tourism uh, almost entirely unlinked to the built environment. Stop me if I'm wrong. This is really just the information I'm getting from my interviews. I may well be out of line, but I'd be fascinated to know if I am on the right track. I believe that tourism policy and regeneration uh, development plans are not required to link to the built environment. It's something that strikes me as particularly uh, difficult to understand coming from a country um, where built environment and tourism seem hand in hand. I, I mean, I now live in France in a remote area. Uh, and uh, the built environment is particularly important uh, in the tourism offer. Um, so the fourth of my questions I wanted to look at were the commonalities between sites, uh, what they experienced as uh, common understandings. And one of those that I picked out, I've called the gold rush mentality. Again, it's not meant it's looking at what I think are important themes. And it strikes as particularly obvious coming from a site like the S, which was right at the Canary Wharf, uh, where making money was obviously more important than anything. I had a conversation with one of, the, uh, one of the management at Canary Wharf at what point when we were looking to try and have some support, and I was simply told, uh, old doesn't work here. Um, so the gold rush mentality, what I'm trying to understand from it is the idea of a drive to um, factory and economic imperatives. Uh, there seems to be something I was told maybe that equates to the mentality or the mindset of uh, the fishing industry, that there isn't much uh, 
point in thinking too much about whether or not it's time to go and um, um, to uh, to to collect a harvest or or to take your ships out. It's thing that you do at the moment, uh, and this seemed maybe to drive the idea that um, the complexity of is perhaps something that isn't considered as carefully as it might be. And the my question, what I've discussed, which were uh, the issue of the individuals who are uh, instrumental in becoming uh, the leaders of these sites. They're often creative industries, often artists. They're obviously the people that can uh, uh, imagine the site before other people uh, maybe do, and they are absolutely driven individuals. They are the, the, the nuggets, if you like, the, the, the seeds that we need to water and fund in order to get these projects off the ground. Um, they are a common theme that is often one that comes up, as is the point that I made uh, within the idea of commonalities, which is that of ugly buildings. And that is something that we will all be familiar with. When you look at an, an, an industrial site, uh, many of them are obviously abandoned. Uh, think back to the Bankside Power Station. Um, and in many ways, they are considered to be uh, worthy of demolition because they are in a terrible state. Some of these uh, comments I, I like in particular because I can relate to them in terms of the ship that we first found when we bought it for a pound. It was in a terrible state. Uh, it doesn't obviously relate to the buildings when they've been completed. Um, and you'd be hard pressed to call the Marshall House or any of the buildings that I've already cited ugly or dirty today. But once they've been uh, restored, they become uh, icons and symbols of um, uh, local communities. And people find them um, tremendously worthy uh, of, of saving once they've been past that point of abandonment. Um, so the challenges and obstacles are one of the things that I wanted to look at. Uh, and that, again, is the question of scale. We've looked at some of the buildings already. Uh, the scale of these buildings is something that is extremely difficult uh, to contemplate if you're looking at it at a state of abandonment. Um, I've seen many of these structures uh, and, and understood just how vast and daunting they are to the, uh, to the people who start off the restoration campaigns. Um, and that is one of the reasons why that seems to lead to the next of my topics, which um, is, is really a, a personal or an emotive issue, and that is one of burnout. These individuals, these visionaries, if you like, the people who become the leaders of these projects at the very beginning, the artists, let's say, or the architects, um, tr commit a huge amount of their personal uh, capital into the projects. Um, and yet they get to a point sometimes where it's just not tenable. Um, and they see the future as a, a bleak thing that hasn't actually come up to its full realization. Uh, and that's something that um, we need to understand when it comes to uh, funding and support. A lot of the time funders think that these buildings are huge money pits, that they're going to be impossible to uh, realize. Uh, but as I've tried to explain, there are different levels of conservation. Um, and these individuals are the ones that can bring together the support through volunteering often. Uh, that doesn't mean that they have to be massive sinkholes for money. Uh, and neither do they have to be 100% completed as I think I tried to explain uh, in the examples of those that are conserved rather than restored. Um, but once you get past, hopefully, the burnout of the individuals, uh, you also find that they face skepticism uh, when they are facing public opposition. Um, and again, it comes back to this point about in the state of abandonment, it's very difficult to foresee the possibilities that some of these individuals are capable of doing. Uh, and in order to bring the community with them, they must be able to communicate that vision. Uh, but that skepticism is there nonetheless. It may well be related back to these issues of 
um, humiliation or shame or a sense of abandonment or exploitation. Um, and if we can get past those, hopefully uh, we get to a point where we are on track, we've passed the point uh, of uh, critical danger and at risk, uh, and we get to a point where we have uh, buildings like the Shell Station um, that are actually now seen as icons for the community rather than just a dirty old repair station. So uh, on a... Um, a uh, last point, and again, as I said, this is not meant by in terms of criticism uh, at Minyastoft, and I'm trying to understand a little bit about the uh, listing regulations and the current legislation, and I'm looking at it as an outsider. Um, I am trying to understand what is behind the 2013 Cultural Heritage Act that uh, almost uh, unilaterally uh, protects 100-year-old buildings and yet leaves almost all, all buildings less than 100 years old, unprotected. Uh, there's a lot of criticism among uh, the interviewees about that act. Uh, it's only eight years old. Uh, maybe it's worth reviewing. Maybe it be seen as a less binary uh, piece of legislation and that buildings that are within the 20th century could become considered worth saving. Um, but uh, it was certainly something that came up on frequent occasions in my conversations. And uh, within that, the last of my points was simply that of demolition and loss. And I think I've pretty much covered that, but some, some of these quotes I found pretty poignant, um, especially there were references on many occasions uh, to the area of Skulagata, uh, which I didn't have the privilege of uh, uh, of knowing, but I believe that it was a part of a uh, town which was uh, probably worth saving and which maybe today we might have made a different choice about saving. Um, but um, we continue to uh, knock down buildings, which maybe in the future we might look back at in the same way as people look back at School Agata today. So those are my research questions, um, and that's pretty much the nub of the uh, talk in the sense that that was the uh, research that I came to do, having completed the projects I was involved with in London. Um, and it's brought me to these conclusions, and again, they're open to discussion, uh, but it clearly seems from the research that I did that the statutory legislation leaves many 20th century buildings unprotected. Um, of the other conclusions, there seemed to be a lack of public awareness uh, of uh, industrial heritage and a lack of awareness of the importance of 20th century buildings in particular. There seemed to be this very clear understanding that everything over 100 years old was good, uh, everything under 100 years old, not so much. It, it clearly cannot uh, be a, a, a way forward in terms of protection to be quite so black and white. Um, a lack of coherent planning, particularly within tourism policy for the built environment, um, and regional funding that is erratic. Now, that's not an Icelandic issue. Regional funding for uh, um, industrial heritage restoration is erratic at best, but it's just worth maybe pointing out. And the last of my points or conclusions was that the benefits of volunteering, from what I could understand, are being missed uh, as a result of some embedded sense of suspicion, but also maybe of exploitation, which seemed to be a constant and recurring theme. Um, and within that uh, last conclusion, uh, Dr. Cook just passed me yesterday something that I thought was incredibly uh, valuable uh, in the government's own paper uh, on indicators for measuring well-being. Formal volunteering activities are listed uh, as part of the UN SDGs. I'd like to know uh, if that's making any progress in government strategy. Um, but that's pretty much the extent of my work. This was just one of the slides I wanted to show you. Uh, this is the European Route of Industrial Heritage from their website. Gives you an idea of just how many uh, sites are active in mainland Europe. There are, if you look on their site, four sites that in theory are active in Iceland. But from my investigation, I don't believe they are. But I think there's a huge amount to be done in terms of bringing that into uh, Iceland's built environment. 
And finally, uh, just some policy recommendations coming out of those conclusions. Extension, as you can imagine, of the ERIH. Um, the integration of industrial heritage into tourism policy. New legislation to protect 20th century buildings. And uh, a listings register of significant 20th century buildings. I know Minya Stoffman has uh, a map on the website of listed buildings. Uh, but I think the idea of a proactive initiative, budget notwithstanding, would be a very interesting project to consider. Um, and finally, the <laughs> implementation of a national volunteer agency and maybe addressing the issues or the resistance that seems to exist to volunteering and deconstructing this conflation between volunteering and uh, internships, which are very, very different things. Um, that's it from my point of view. I just wanted to thank Bigner Stoffman and the Maritime Museum for hosting the talk, uh, all my participants, and uh, all the research is available uh, if you want to let me know if you'd like a copy. Uh, I'm sure I've trodden on a few toes. Uh, I'm sure I've upset some sensitivities, and I'm not intending to be critical as an outsider. I'm just fascinated in the subject, so please do shoot me down. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Oh, yeah, sure. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, thank you. Uh, well, thank you. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm very interested also in this. To some extent, it's also it creates a rod for your back, creating these this increasing stock of buildings over 100 years old, that that then just seems to absorb the resources, the the, the few resources that are available. Um, so anyway, I'm, you things you know. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, tourism. So, um, volunteerism is a business. Uh, volunteering is not. Um, volunteerism is basically um, 
organized package tours for often um, either pre-university or just post-university students uh, who are looking to uh, work for good causes, and I put that in inverted commas deliberately, um, in disadvantaged parts of the world. It has become a, I would say, a sector of tourism and not a sector of volunteering. Um, and it has uh, considerable issues with uh, sustainability, has a lot of issues with uh, whether or not the work that is carried out is, is appropriate, uh, is well managed, and is even um, re uh, required in the areas in which they go. Um, and it's, it's, a big, uh, it's, it's a big earner for those in, uh, businesses involved. Volunteering, uh, I see as strictly within the nonprofit sector, uh, and it tends to be community generated, and it is something that is uh, essentially grassroots. Um, and they are very, very different. Um, and I believe that there have been some volunteerism projects in Iceland which have probably um, affected the reputation of volunteering in general. And it, that may be related to why it seems to generate these uh, almost instant negative reactions. Um, as an aside, I, I, I suggested whilst I was doing my research uh, to uh, one establishment that I could help uh, over the weekends with their archive. Um, and the reaction was, no, we don't do that, um, which is unusual to me. I mean, I, I didn't take it personally, I hope, um, but uh, it's unusual to me that, that most organizations, most nonprofits uh, in the UK have an established way in which you can contribute your time in some shape or form. Thank you. Thanks for listening.